Thank you, Mr. President, uh, members of the faculty, board of trustees, graduates of the class of 2014, their friends and loved ones. Thank you for having me here today. I intend to keep my remarks relatively short, and notice I use the word relative, so that I don't bore you any more than is customary in a situation such as this. I do, uh, however, intend to keep my remarks shorter than the introduction that just went on. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> you know, I'm uh, frequently asked, are there too many lawyers? And my answer is, no, I don't think so. Are there too many good lawyers? My answer is absolutely not. And I'll tell you why, for two reasons. First of all, the bar is getting old. There are going to be a lot of us retiring or meeting our great rewards, which are going to open up all kinds of opportunities. Just as the population is getting old, so is the bar. But the second reason I think is more important, and that has to do with your education. You are, by virtue of your degree, a problem solver. And if there's going to be any theme to what I'm talking about today, it is that, a problem solver. You have been taught to think conceptually. You've been taught to to look at both sides of the issue. You've been taught to gather the facts and then to come to a conclusion, make a strong decision. That's what you do. And that's what you've been taught. So there's lots more need for lawyers than just the practice of law. There's need for lawyers in business. There's need for lawyers in education. There's need for lawyers in government. So no, there are not too many lawyers. There are not too many problem solvers. You made a good choice coming to Cooley. Like you, I went to a freestanding law school. Cooley is a freestanding law school, which means every cent that is spent goes in some way to your education. I can look at the legal news weekly, and there's hardly a week goes by that Cooley isn't advertising some new technology, some new courses, or some new guest speaker that's coming in. So I'd like, if I may, to review that education with you slightly so that you're friends and relatives can also know what you have done in the last several years. You know, they're going to look at you today with a smile and a look of uh, pride and joy. It's an interesting look that they give you. Uh, you can't describe it. It's like the new car smell, but you can tell it when you see it. So I think it's a good idea to review what you've gone through in the last three or four years. Cooley prides itself in professionalism. There have had, they have had uh, yearly meetings of lawyers and judges from all over the state to discuss and lay out what professionalism is. And it really comes down to three points, knowledge of the law, skills in the law, and ethics. If we take the first one, knowledge of the law, no question you have a great faculty. I've served with some of them. I have law clerks from Cooley. I've had law clerks from Harvard, 
from Stanford and every major law school, and I can tell you, Cooley graduates stack up with anybody. Let no one tell you any different. A national magazine just came out recently and said that Cooley was the 17th best law school in the nation for teaching a practical legal education. Now, that will drive all the elite law schools to say, oh, you just practice law. We learn the theory of law. That's nonsense. They used to say that about the Detroit College of Law when we always finished number one in the state bar. They'd say, well, you learn Michigan law, but we at Michigan, we learn the theory of law. Well, you can't be a good lawyer. You can't be a good practicing lawyer unless you know the theory of law. Hell, we all learn the rule against perpetuities and the Shelley's rule. And I can tell you, after 51 years, I have never used either of those rules. <laughs> So there's no question that, that you meet the first aspect of, of the legal education, the professional education, and that's knowledge. I'm going to digress for just one moment when we talk about knowledge, and that's about the bar exam. It's coming, and you've got to go through it. There is no reason, none whatsoever, that 100% of you do not pass, cannot pass this bar examination. You're going to look to the left of you and the right of you, and you're all going to pass the bar. And the reason I say that, and the reason I tell you loved ones that is for the next several months you're going to work like you have never worked before. <laughs> ah, if you want to pass that bar you're going to have to work. Cooley offers some refresher courses in the bar. There are commercial courses in the bar and I suggest you all take one. I did 51 years ago and you need to take it, but you need to work, work, work. Success is only, you only hear success in front of work in one place, and that's the dictionary. Success follows work. Let me tell you two quick stories, and we'll move on to your skills. First of all, when I went to Detroit College of Law, Dean King, who was like the lifetime uh, dean in those days, uh, and in those days the deans used to change the toilet paper in the restrooms too. I mean, they really worked back then. But he had a statistic, and it said that the person that finished in the bottom of the class never failed the bar exam, and that was not true of the person who passed number one in the class. And the reason is quite simple. The person that finished in the last worked and worked. The person that finished number one sometimes didn't think he had to work as hard. So you can't escape it. It's work. It just isn't showing up. Those of you that have had me as a teacher have heard me say, if you're going to try lawsuits, nobody that goes in that courtroom can know more about that case than you. If you're going to take this bar exam and you walk into that examination room, nobody should know more than you at that date. No one. No one. I just... A young man that I've had the pleasure of mentoring just sent me an email just this last week and said, Dear Judge, I passed the bar. 
And I sent him an email back and I said, congratulations. And he sent me one back and said, you know, I failed the bar the first time by eight points. The second time I passed it by 10 points because I wasn't gonna take it the third time. An 18 point swing. And why? Work, work, work. I want 100% of you to pass that bar and there is no reason that you can't do it. <laughs> Skills, that's the second aspect that you have been taught. You had great teachers, you've heard me say that. In fact, I'm one of your teachers, so you obviously know it's great. But Cooley offers specialization courses. If you, if you want to be a trial lawyer, you can take uh, extra courses in trial practice or corporations or tax or whatever. That's all available to you. Cooley offers clinics so that you can get real life experience talking to clients, figuring out what their problems are, and so forth. And if specialization and clinics aren't enough, they have numerous organizations and fraternities. And these allow you to get together with your colleagues, and this is going to make a difference to you, I could tell you, all your life. And in addition, they have guest speakers who enrich your legal education. And if those three aren't enough, they have interns and externships. I have an internship in my office. And the students from Cooley get a real case. They make the research. They write out a memo for me to use in oral argument, just as my law clerks do. So you get real experience. You're going to know the skills. And lastly is ethics. Cooley spends a lot of time on ethics. First of all, every one of you, when you came to this school, took an oath of honor. And Cooley enforces that oath. And most of you have taken a professional ethics course, and some of you have taken the bar exam even for ethics at this point. So you know them, but they're not too complicated. Sure, we want you to do pro bono work. That's, that's an ethical obligation. But it's like the movie in 1939 with Henry Fonda. Now, I don't know if you know who Henry Fonda is. Maybe your grandparent could tell you. And if your grandparent can't tell you who Henry Fonda is, and maybe your parents can, but just remind them Henry Fonda was Jane Fonda's father so that you can get that clear. But if you don't know who he is, he's a movie star in the 30s, 40s, and through the 70s, I believe. Anyway, he was playing young Abe Lincoln, and he was stretched out under a tree reading Blackstone commentaries. And he got up and closed the book, and he said, by jeepers, that's all there is to it. Right's right, and wrong's wrong. And by jeepers, that's all there is to ethics. Right's right, and wrong's wrong. You are going to be defined by your ethics. If you're going to be that problem solver that I talk about, you have to solve the problems in an ethical way. So here I have you with knowledge, skills, the right and the ability to tell right from wrong. And now I say, you're a problem solver. And you're going to say to me, judge, it's tough out there. How are we going to solve problems with the way it is? Well, let me tell you something, young folks. 
it's always been tough out there. When I graduated from law school and became a member of the bar in 1963, the firm I was with decided the way to be a trial lawyer was to send me out and argue motions every Friday at Wayne County. That was her motion day. And one Friday, I was in a man named Piggins' courtroom, Judge Piggins, and his law clerk came up and whispered something in his ear, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, the president has been shot and killed. 1963, my first year. This is the 20th century. What does he mean, the president of the United States has been killed? That was the beginning of some hard times. The Vietnam War spun out of control. There were race riots. The hippie movement had started. The college students started to riot, just like some third world country, to the extent that they even blew up college buildings. The economy, had, the inflation had soared so high that older people who had invested their money in bonds and the bank account to be safe had lost all of their savings. The drug culture began, which has changed the culture of our country even to today. So yeah, you've got hard times, but everybody has hard times. Let me talk about yours for a minute. Just finished two incredibly long wars. We have a nation that is, has so much debt it's hard to see how we're going to escape from it. We have a new health care law that nobody, including the legislatures, as they like to brag, will pass it and then we'll read about it. Nobody knows what it means, what it's going to do. We have an unemployment rate that's unbelievably high if you take into account the people that quit looking for a job. We have an international situation where the Mideast, people, rogue nations are building atomic bombs as we reduce our arsenal. The Mideast is in turmoil. China is threatening Vietnamese, Japan, and the Philippines, all of whom we have relationships with. Russia is starting to move, as you can read every day on the Ukraine. Yeah, you got lots of problems too. And who's gonna solve them? You are going to solve them. Let me give you an example if you think that's far-fetched. Let me tell you about three quick Cooley graduates, you got John Engler, three-time governor of the state of Michigan, a Cooley graduate, who's president of the American Manufacturers Association. He's doing what he can to keep business going so that people have jobs. You've got uh, Kathleen Reynolds, senior vice president of CMS Energy, a Fortune 500 co company working on energy problems, a Cooley graduate. One of your board of trustees is Dennis Swan, president of the Sparrow Health Corporation and chairman of the board of the Michigan Hospital Association, a Cooley graduate. He's out trying to solve your health care problems. They all need help. They all need the problem solver. This country, since its colonial days, has always had troubles. And in each and every time, we've turned to the bar, to the attorneys, to solve those problems. 
with all of these new regulations and health regulations, who's going to protect our right to privacy? You, the attorney, that's who. Who's going to make sure that the properties we buy or the properties we sell are going to be done properly? You, the attorneys. Who's going to protect our environment and at the same time keep our businesses running? You, the attorneys. Who's going to protect us from the tax collector? You, the attorneys. Who's going to protect our assets that we've worked a lifetime to accumulate? You, the attorneys. Who's going to protect us from discrimination? You, the attorneys. Who will protect our religious freedoms? You, the attorneys. Who will protect our right to speech? You, the attorneys. And maybe most important of all for the United States, who is going to assure that this is a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people? You guessed it. You, the attorneys. Thomas Cooley called you the ministers of justice. And he's correct. I call you the problem solvers of today. I've been a lawyer for 51 years. Now you all should swan and say, oh my God, he doesn't look that old, does he? <laughs> but I can tell you, I can tell you that I envy you. I wish I was starting out again. I didn't know a lawyer, but I had a great career, and I enjoyed every bit of it. Use what you've learned. Do it right, and you'll be successful, you ministers of justice. Let me close with an old Irish blessing. May the road rise up to meet you, May the wind always be at your back. And may the Lord hold each of you in the hollow of his hands. Thank you very much.